Hey y'all, it's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. Roby with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. And we got James behind the camera. So we're on part four of our five part trip up the Mississippi from New Orleans, road trip that you could do yourself. And we are today in our hometown. We home! St. Francisville, yes! Louisiana. And y'all like, obviously bias for us all being from here. But this is like one of the coolest towns in, I'd say the South, or just like to study interesting small towns wherever. I think it's a place that people should know about more than they do. It's a real standout. And you can get a glimpse just as we go through this very beginning part of our walk through the historic district of town. Like St. Francisville has some of the stuff that you'd expect out of a cool small town, like cute little inns, good places to get your breakfast or your lunch. We have Birdman Coffee and Books right next to us, which we have patronized already during our stay. And we got the Magnolia Cafe, lunch or dinner with uh, with live music on the weekends. And of course, there's antique stores. Can't have a cute little town on the Mississippi without antiques. I think a good like 30% of our house is furnished out of this building over here. Yeah, I want to say we got a lot of furniture from this place. <laughs> it's a lot. And art galleries too. We have Backwoods Gallery right over across the street. So you have this like local art and music and at some points theater scene that's oh yeah more than you'd expect out of a town of about 2,000 people in a parish of not a whole lot more than that when I'm, I be hearing you say that I have to remind myself like how tiny we actually is <laughs> like we are so small but there's like so much culture and so much like so many traditions just packed into one little tiny little space it's like concentrated yeah. and we're like the guardians of the carriers of said culture and traditions that's right. And we have some, a lot of stuff that we want to share with y'all. We're going to focus this on a walk through town because there is a whole lot you could see just on foot. But there's also a lot of stuff in West Feliciana Parish, the parish where St. Francisville is located and of which it is the parish seat, where you could get around a little bit by car. And if you're using a car to get here, I would say like very first thing you'd want to do in order to get a real sense of the place is to stop on the way into town right before you reach St. Francisville at a place called Hemingbow, but I think just kind of grabs the whole first impression. This is just off the highway. There's a sign for it as you're coming into town and you pull in and it basically, there's a sign right by the entrance that just says something along the lines of just once in a while in life, everybody needs some space to reflect and decide what they're about. And Hemingbow is here for that. It's just this big, open, free to enter park full of these kind of Greek revival structures. There's an amphitheater, there's a hedgerow maze, and there's spaces for events like concerts and weddings and stuff, and a whole lot of peacocks. One of my favorite things is the peacocks <laughs> because they are just everywhere. You just walking in, there's peacocks over here, peacocks, peacocks over here, peacock chilling right there on the seat. You walk to the seat, the peacock look at you and be like, well, you're not getting my seat. <laughs> my favorite thing also that we discovered some years ago is that there's a family of wild turkeys that actually live in the woods nearby. And sometimes you can actually hear them making verbal noises out there in the woods. It's a wonderful place. And on top of it being this like Greek revival sculpture park, you also have in it, as of a couple years ago, a Japanese garden called the Imahara Legacy Garden. And this is from a family of Japanese American folks who relocated here after the Japanese internment during World War II to first New Orleans and then up here, the father of this family got hired to landscape one of the houses in the area that we'll tell you about, but his son, Walter Imahara, is now this huge fixture in landscape architecture in the region. And so you have this Japanese American style garden that includes things like a lot of plants from that region of the world, but also their like family memorial from Hiroshima and a Tori and several Tori gates, these gates that are traditional in Japanese architecture. So this incredible fusion that really speaks to the distinctiveness of the place. So like you go there and you immediately know you're somewhere really unusual and really special. Most cities don't have Japanese gardens, much less small towns like this. That's why we so unique. And we are also by our town hall right now, which I think lets you get a little bit into why things are as unusual as they are. So one element of it definitely is the fact that this is a better, a, a, a more than typically well-off small town. And there's a few reasons for that. We have multiple industries here. St. Francisville lives off of a combination of, I'd say mainly tourism, a nuclear power plant, 
and a notorious prison. Yes, and I was it's about to say, don't forget companies. about Angola. <laughs> so Angola prison, y'all might have heard of, and like that's out towards the side of town where Roby's family lives. Yeah, I grew up in the woods, but we'll get to that in a little while. <laughs> it's a really famous place, and something that you might know best from uh, Dead Man Walking, yeah. the book by Sister Helen Prejean, where she spent time being a spiritual counselor to prisoners there on death row, and the majority of people at that prison are serving life sentences. In addition to all the historic house tourism here, a couple times a year people travel here in massive numbers to go to the Angola Prison Rodeo, which is just kind of all the strangeness of Southern culture tied up in a, in a little bag. One of the, the greatest things about that rodeo is that it gives a lot of the people there who are in prison a chance to actually um, learn new crafts and actually sell their products to the public. Um, actually, my family on the Baptist side of my family, we spent a lot of time out there like singing for those prisoners and actually uh, buying a lot of their products. Actually, my first belt when I was seven years old actually came from an inmate who actually carved my name on a piece of leather and turned that leather into a belt. And I still have it to this day. Didn't know that. Yeah. When you look for the Angola Prison Rodeo on a search engine, it's listed on maps as an art gallery because while the art of rodeo, which a lot of people in Louisiana grow up with, and this is a state penitentiary, so the prisoners there, a lot of them are coming from that background already, so they have an exposure to that. So for another part of the country, imagine like a prison sponsoring a football game every year. It's somewhat like that, but there is this huge craft selling element where people make these incredible things and they keep a very small portion of the money that they make, but an income is almost a necessary thing to make prison life at all comfortable. So. This is a really unusual and complicated part. It feels like the Roman Colosseum to some people when they visit it, but there is a whole lot more to it than That's that. a lot. So between this nuclear power plant that brings a lot of very like highly skilled white collar jobs to the area and this prison that is mostly guards and which makes the parish two thirds male in population and tourism, which brings people here from all over the world traveling it's a really unusual combination of things that makes this small town really viable in a way that small towns don't always seem to be today. There's the nature element too, and we actually have a pretty cool piece of, uh, of natural accident right across the street. So one thing that the area is famous for is there's the Cat Island Preserve, Cat Island Natural Area. Natural area, I guess, yeah. There we go. <laughs> and there's also, which is a, a Pretty cool big nature preserve, a little ways outside of town, plus the Clark Creek Natural Area, which is an incredible area for hiking, a little bit over the Mississippi border, kind of along the trajectory of our next stop. And Cat Island has this incredible millennium and a half old cypress tree, which is, I want to say the oldest cypress tree, at least on this side of the continent, maybe in a much bigger territory than that. And for a little poetic nod to that, we have a, uh, an unusual natural occurrence. <laughs> right here along Ferdinand Street, the main street through town. So this is one of our famous live oaks growing out of a cedar tree. The ribbon, as far as I'm aware, doesn't play a significant role in holding them together at this point, but they've both managed to survive for, I don't have any idea how long. Well, according to some resources, this is over a hundred years old. Oof. The Cat Island Cypress tree blows this out of the water. It is majestic and gigantic and it just dwarfs you. The water is really high in the river as we saw further down the river right now so it's not actually accessible just this moment. I also want to tell y'all if you are a big fishing fan Cat Island is the place to go. I, I actually have relatives who are living in an area and my aunt used to take me out there all the time. We used to catch loads and loads of catfish. Y'all are getting into Roby's expertise fishermen over here. We also have along this whole stretch y'all a lot of historic houses and this is one glimpse of that. We've talked plantations on this road trip a lot, but there's a ton of them here in town that are unusually well preserved. There was a whole kind of movement towards the preservation of these places, actually partly involving the same guy who built that Hemingbow area, it's guy Arlen Deese. And some of the houses in town, you'd see these historic plaques on that commemorates the time they're from, and you're looking at generally antebellum. But then when you get out a little distance from town, there's some very famous plantations, including most famously the Myrtles Plantation. And that is actually a place where all three of us 
Roby and I and James, who's a tour guide himself sometimes, all cut our tour guiding teeth. And y'all might have heard of this place as a famously haunted plantation. The, the, the ghost of Chloe that haunts that is the thing that people have most often heard of. But it's just Roby and a sheep. <laughs> you know. And some water balloons. And some water balloons water that balloons. my godmother kind of tucked up in there. If, yeah. if you see any of the Myrtle's Plantation specials, like the old ones on the Discovery Channel, and you see the ghost of Chloe on TV, it's actually me and drag. <laughs> So you heard it first here. <laughs> and sometimes it's you actually talking about and the stories too. And sometimes it's me actually talking about the stories. During the time that we worked there, that, that James and I were there along with Roby, like at that point, you had confided a lot less in us about your family history, yeah. about your kind of personal religious life. And nowadays, now that we no longer work there, you've told us a lot more about your connection with that site. And it's just crazy to imagine that you were working there while knowing the things that you knew, yep. but also really appropriate that it was you doing it. Right. Um, one of my favorite things is like whenever I was doing tours there, I was telling people that I was actually a descendant of the people who were slaves on that plantation and just seeing their eyes just go, and what are you doing here? I'm telling you my family history. Also, there's a voodoo element here that you guys don't know about. Of course, James and Andrew didn't know about these things because of our vow of secrecy in the religion. And as you get older, those vows become more lax. So I was able to through time tell them exactly about my family connections there. But the fact that my family is still here and then I started working there as a tour guide and with the two of the people that I actually grew up with, keeping it a secret all these years and then finally becoming older and enlightening them saying, hey, by the way, I go deep into this plantation was kind of shocking to these two. Yeah, I think we, we learned an awful lot. And, and for y'all who don't know some of this stuff already, Roby has also taken us on some tours of that history in New Orleans through the Voodoo Tour video that we've created. The Treme Tour, we get somewhat into that yes, stuff as well. We do. And so here, we're really back to where it all began. And, and part of a visit to St. Francisville for us, I think less frequently for tourists, certainly almost never for tourists, is to go out to the old plantations that are no longer standing. And there's all kinds of historical stuff out there that connects to the enslaved people who were no longer enslaved after the Civil War and stayed around with the plantation was long since gone. My family land. Um, a lot of the, we, we live on a road called Sligo Road and the Hollywood Plantation used to be out there as well. And I'm descended from people from three plantations, which is the Myrtles Plantation, which is still standing, the Greenwood Plantation, and then the one that's degraded the most when my family is the Hollywood Plantation. And that land where the Hollywood Plantation was, we still live there. My family never left. They just stayed, reproduced, and stayed, reproduced, and bam, here I am. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of the plantations that were on the river or even near the river, a lot of them, many of them got burned down. Some of them don't have plaques. Some of them don't even, some of them we don't even know about. Like that's how many there were. There's old chimneys out there from the plantation house. There's old artifacts. There's, there's old glass bottles that we found like whenever we were kids. So there's many bits and pieces of things out there on my family land that just through time, some of the knowledge got lost, but thanks to older people in my family who I've talked to have been passed down to me and now I can pass down to future generations as well. Also y'all, so talking about all these plantations and that giving us this really antebellum window of time when obviously a lot of the history was developing here, St. Francisville is one of these older towns. It's, as St. Francisville, it's an early 19th century town, but there has been an older settlement here. So what we call St. Francisville is kind of a successor to this community called Bayou Serra. Mm -hmm. And the, that's an actual bayou that Roby's family lives along, but it was the, this body of water that meets with the river downhill of where we are. And it was a really flood prone area. So there was this whole very developed little port town, but it ends up, being moved uphill after enough floods. So what's now St. Francisville is kind of this sequel community. And so you see this somewhat like French and Spanish connection that we see with some of Louisiana further south going back, but primarily this is a town developed by English speakers. And you really see that in like differences of building styles. You see it in the names of things. It doesn't quite bear as much of the resemblance to New Orleans, except in the sense that it's a really like culturally vibrant place that jazz and a lot of the culture of South Louisiana has found its way into. Y'all, all through this trip, we have promised spring efflorescence and like 
<laughs> I forget. We have these things all over the place in New Orleans, but like it just is kind of massive and above and beyond here. So like landscaping here is a big piece of the puzzle. And we mentioned this Japanese garden, this Japanese American garden out at Hemingbao and all of Hemingbao is beautifully landscaped. But that is a big element of when you go looking around town, both in the town itself and in some of these sites a little further afield. So there's a couple of plantations that are specifically known for their garden sites. One of them is Rosedown Plantation. This is an early 19th century house. It's one that's located right in town. So easiest one to reach, really. And it's a state historic site. So it's operated with some historical rigor that you can trust the information they're providing. And James was the tour guide here. So correct me if I'm wrong about anything. But Martha Turnbull there produced these garden diaries with this massive sort of Versailles style garden that she was producing there that provides several decades of insight into what the operation of a garden on a plantation looked like. And so there's all of this knowledge there as well as they've preserved her design and some of her actual plants are still there too. These like 19th century plants, the choices that she made that are still there. Well, and the, the really salient thing is that she was one of the first people to bring these Japanese flowers like azaleas and hydrangeas into the Americas. And that is actually, that's a huge piece of why like it's so appropriate that we have this Japanese garden located here is that like the things that we're known for like azaleas, like camellias, all these different uh, wisteria that we've seen a lot of, all of that stuff comes from Eastern Asia. And so the native plant life here is something that we are not actually incredible at highlighting except for live oak trees. But the things that we've chosen to bring in have this really heavily East Asian connection. Another one of those houses is Afton Villa, which actually has the Japanese connection on multiple fronts, because not only does it feature a lot of that plant life, but the gardens were actually originally landscaped by James Imahara, Walter Imahara's father. And that's what brought this Japanese American family from New Orleans up here to St. Francisville in the first place. So the whole reason why we have this Japanese American garden is this strange intertwining story of old plantations and the Japanese internment during World War II and the interesting East Asian agricultural choices that we've made here. And when you go visit the site today, it doesn't look like a plantation. The house burned down in the 1970s, and it was this, this Gothic revival house, really remarkable looking. But all you have there today is the ruins and this incredibly long winding oak alley leading up to them, and then the gardens themselves that go way beyond that, and the small family burial site that's kind of surrounded by greenery out there. So uh, I think as plantation weddings go, my sister got married there, but mm. at a plantation that is not a plantation anymore, does that pass muster? It passed muster. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and on this side of the street, y'all, so we've passed by a lot of what would just be kind of sightseeing, in the area. But over there we have the West Feliciana Historical Society. They've got an exhibit that covers the history of St. Francisville through the lens of that Bayou Serra community that used to be down the river. You can see that mapped out, what some of it looked like, things that have been preserved from it. And they've also got stuff about like musicians who are from the area, kind of some blues history, lots and lots of different things, artifacts. I mean, as a small town museum goes, it's really rigorous and they've continually improved it over time. So this is worth a stop and they've got all the information about all the different things you could do around town, all these plantation visits you could do, various other activities, and they're not like the city uh, concierge is gonna be making a, so many bucks off of it. So it's more unbiased information, I'd say. We've mentioned on that Treme tour, y'all, that we, we talked about a moment ago, how in New Orleans, post-slavery, one of the really common ways for former enslaved people and, and for lots of other groups of people too, immigrants, um, folks from a lot of different backgrounds, to watch out for each other's well-being was through the creation of these benevolent societies. And we actually have a late 19th century benevolent society building that was specifically about providing uh, medical services, burial services for former enslaved people. So while a lot of that side of the story is not as visible here in town because this was the land of the highest value, you do get little bits of it here and there. And this is one of, our, uh, one of the places that the town has decided to punch up more recently so even here uh you know we've i think we've had a, a a evolving awareness or an evolving priority maybe of putting the less comfortable sides of local history on display to the point where actually so our town had an event called the audubon pilgrimage yeah that would go down for years that was just kind of this very romantic reenactment of basically 
19th century life for white people. It was plantation splendor and the, the tours of the houses and interior design and all of these, all, you know, period gear and all that. But it, it presented this picture of the 19th century that didn't involve enslaved people, which the real one right. did. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be the one to say it because I feel like I have the authority to say it. Um, as a person of color from this town, it was not pleasant. And I can tell you a bunch of my friends who actually went to this said pilgrimage and I won't let them do it. I'll do it myself. I'll destroy it myself. Um, one of my friends even told me that when he would dress up and garb for the pilgrimage, that they would give him a whip and he would be like a slave owner in training. And they would teach him how to crack the whip over a slave. And this is something that was going on in our town for a long time until recently where this ended. And I, for one, am very happy that it is no longer a thing. So heritage or not, if it involves hurting people, I don't care what color you are, like it needs to stop. And I have to say our town is kind of progressive when it comes to recognizing like people of color, the history of slavery, putting it out on display. It may make you uncomfortable, but we'll recognize like, hey, slavery happened here. This is what we're doing to remind you that it was a bad and terrible thing. And that tradition of the pilgrimage was one of the things that they recently was like, yeah, no, we can't do this. Slice. And, and done. with the idea too, I mean, reading their statement when they decided to, I, I think the, the, the presentation was sort of suspending it mm -hmm. until a way can be found to do it more realistically, to make it a better commemoration of history and a truer right. commemoration of history than it was. Because like, that's kind of the ultimate objective criticism of these things is just that the vision of the past they portrayed just wasn't true. It was, it was so very inaccurate and no black folks. And the one time I did go there, like people were staring at me like, oh, there's a token black guy there. And I'm just like, yeah, born and raised here, too. A descendant of these people on this plantation. And you're teaching these children how to crack a whip over a slave's back. OK, never go back there again. Um, and it's 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 a little bit of sweet because you want to teach the history, but you want to do it accurately. And to what Andrew just said, I think they're going to regroup and like because the history needs to be taught. Just make sure you tell it accurately. We are at that split off to Royal Street, y'all. So if you ever do the walk through town, the drive through town, any of that, it's worth doing the loop that we're doing here. This kind of goes over to some of the, the buildings that really stand out as extremely historic on their own. And there's a goldfish pond on the way. <laughs> What's not to love? I, I'm laughing because of the history of the goldfish in the pond, <laughs> in the fountain. Uh, That's a sort of uh, but, <laughs> they, that was about the Paris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So a lot of our enjoy enjoyable times as kids was like wandering around in the woods. And of course, you know, being deep in the woods when you're from a small town, it's it's both normal and kind of exceptional. It has this these you can get sort of a supernatural feeling out of it. And I remember many times being in the woods and you just hear a voice speaking in the distance what it sounded like shouting at you. And it just so happened that we had this very wide ranging and talented macaw that lived in town right at the house across the street. And Alex would just be in an open cage in his front yard and once in a while he'd go flying around. And if he found, I don't know if he even cared whether people were around, he would just talk. But of course, if you were there, you'd be the one to hear him. And uh, many a creepy afternoon was spent unknowingly in Alex's company. You never knew if it was a, a hostile person or a hunter in the distance or, a, or a, an evil spirit or just a talkative macaw. Good times. You mentioned the smallness of town, y'all, and, and how there's really only one street. And it's not only because there's only enough people here to occupy one street. It's also because there's only room for one street in St. Francisville. When the city moved up the hill from Bayou Serra to this natural bluff that it's located on today, there was a limitation that that came with, where Bayou Serra was a, a rectangular grid of a town, basically in James's words, as I remember them from a long time ago, St. Francisville had to become a mile long and an inch wide because this natural bluff was super narrow. And while as you're going through town, you don't always have an awareness of that fact. If you go around the backs of buildings, you can see while many of them are built at street level on the front, they have these really tall stilts on the back that makes them able to stand on the sloped surface. And every here and there, you get this wide open vista of where things just plunge out from under you. So, great example. Man. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's <laughs> so 
it's continually eroding too. So I'm, there's always little surprises when we come out here again. But this is just plunging down into the lowland of the bayous. And ultimately, that's the land where the water is running off into the river. And it's on either side of town. So you can never go very far before you reach this. Y'all, walking along Royal Street, we're passing by one of the churches in town, the Methodist Church that I used to attend as a kid. And it's one of the survivors from down the hill in Bayou Serra. So when they moved the community up the hill, saving what buildings they could was a priority. And in this case, you had this kind of convenient, long, narrow steeple. So the arrangement they made with this and with many other buildings was to roll them in pieces up the hill by putting logs underneath. So you can picture logs underneath the whole length of that steeple, getting it all the way up here and then re-erecting it here. So it was established 1844, but you have that building moved up in 1899 when the community comes up the hill. We made a brief detour around behind some buildings on Royal Street, but if you take a glimpse off of Royal Street over towards the edge of the bluff, you also can spot another religious building, which is the old Temple Sinai. So St. Francisville had, no longer has, but did have a pretty sizable Jewish community at one time. There's a Jewish cemetery no longer in active use right by where I grew up. And this place also speaks to the old pre-desegregation high school that's located right behind called Julius Freehan. And this is a particularly famous man from New Orleans who is buried there in Metairie Cemetery, the one that we give a tour of in, on our cemetery tour video, and kind of a, a, a patron of a great many different causes, but among other things, a contributor to schools. And so you find in this town with, at this point, very few Jewish residents, an old school named after a Jewish man. It's one of those unusual things that kind of illustrates a piece of history that most people who live here aren't consciously aware of at this point. Yeah. We're also passing along Grandmother's Buttons, so as like cute little small town quaint businesses go, y'all, you are you cannot even tell what a big deal this place is as you pass by. It's located in a former bank building, so hence the really splendid edifice. But it's um, a building with kind of a, a, a nationwide market and a worldwide pull. The founder of this makes button jewelry that started from just her grandmother's personal button collection and now like imports glass from Czechia and supplies from all over that are... Czechia. Czechia is the current name for what was once called the Czech Republic. Look it up. All right, I bet. It's cool though, and you can, if you go in there, you can go in the bank vault and see the old bank vault and how that works, as well as all the amazing handmade jewelry. Yeah, the stuff is amazing to see, and, and it really like, it kind of just, I think it's an incredible example of how cosmopolitan this place is even though it is small and, and you could it's it's small but it's not isolated I and guess. you can buy their stuff online the thing there yes absolutely. hashtag not sponsored and not related to them i'm mad because this building used to have some good vines growing out the ground on the building and then for one movie they didn't total down vines down replace them with plastic vines and then ain't no more vines growing no more did you see the movie i ain't seen the movie because i ain't won't seek the movie <laughs> I like her. She was good in the next Karate Kid, but still. <laughs> <laughs> One of quite a few. I've forgotten the list of movies. Mm -hmm. Reaping, the classic, the St. Francisville Experiment. Oh, don't Google that. Oh, North Lord. and South. <laughs> North and South was soon, yeah. Some of those old, yeah, 1960s racism, the Civil War films. The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Yeah. Is that a movie? I don't know if that's real, but... I <laughs> <laughs> It is. It's the first movie that I think it's the first movie that uh, Carol Sutton was in. Oh, really? Do, oh, do wow. Google her. Yes, please Google Miss mm -hmm. Carol Sutton. Mm -hmm. That is a force to be reckoned with. Amazing. Rest in peace. Second most important thing about this building after its history of removed plastic vines is you can see perhaps with the plaque over there, it's called the Cabildo. And if you know your Jackson Square French Quarter history, the Cabildo there in Jackson Square is the former city hall. And that's so a Cabildo is a Spanish city council. So this was Spanish land for a while, as well as being English land for a while. So it's an appropriate place for there to be a cabildo. And it also was its own really short-lived independent country for a bit. The area of Louisiana we've been passing through between Baton Rouge and here is the kind of narrow range of what we call West Florida. Today, they're called the Florida parishes, but they were part of the province of West Florida that extended basically from around where the Florida panhandle ends now, in a wider stretch of land over through Alabama and Mississippi to us. And that land changed hands a number of times. Eventually, shortly after the Louisiana Purchase, 
when the land on the west side of the Mississippi and New Orleans all becomes American for the first time, people on this side of the river, some of whom had been Tories from the American Revolution who decided they wanted to come and avoid life in the 13 colonies in their own independent nation, they had their own little micro-revolution here. So for a hot minute, this area gets taken over by locals and it turns into the Republic of West Florida. And when you go around in St. Francisville today, you see this blue flag with a white star, and that is the flag of the West Florida Republic. And we have a little monument to it over here. That flag is all over St. Francisville today because it is also the St. Francisville town flag. So you can see the Republic of West Florida and the star in here indicating its age says 1810 because the entire history of that Republic fell into the year 1810. It was around for a month and a half, but St. Francisville was its capital and this was its capital building. And so y'all are at a politically very, very, very important site to the history of a very, very, very unimportant country because it was pretty much annexed by the US right away, generally to the happiness of the people who lived here. So it was <laughs> a, a revolution followed by a very willing submission afterwards. All, all fight and then all, all friendliness. So y'all, back when I was a tour guide at the Myrtles, we made $10 an hour. That's nothing. I know you guys are gonna tip us $30 an hour for this tour. I appreciate that. But we had to make some extra cash. So we found other places in town we could tour and we would, I'm not gonna say harvest, but we would find tourists at the Myrtles, staying at the bed and breakfast and other places and bring them into town and give them a tour of town. People loved it. And one of the best places to do after a ghost tour at the Myrtles Plantation was a midnight tour of Grace Episcopal Cemetery. We're gonna take you now. <laughs> All right, I set it up. You, you take it from here. <laughs> Y'all, James is leading with the personal history, but this place is the bomb. It is just, I mean, you kind of don't even think about the fact that it's a cemetery when you step inside because it is just the best combination of live oak trees and azalea bushes and this gorgeous church that is possible. And when you pass through the gate, when we pass through the gate together, you'll see what I mean. But it is a cemetery, so, you know, comport yourself with dignity. And lots of the people of some historical note are in here, so we'll, we'll point out a few individuals and a few standout monuments. Y'all wipe your feet as you come in. So this is Grace Episcopal Church, which was built on the site of another church that got bombed during the Civil War. This is the newer version, but it's not that new. Y'all, we're visiting the gravesite of the Turnbull family. This is the family that built Rosedown Plantation that we looked at earlier with the beautiful gardens, the one that didn't burn down. You see this big tall obelisk? That's the man of the house, Daniel Turnbull, and his wife? That's that flat plaque right next to him. No comment. This plot here is the family that built the Myrtles Plantation. So kind of an interesting story here, y'all. This particular grave of John Hart of Schenectady, New York, um, is here in the Grace Cemetery uh, for kind of an unusual reason. So he died during the Civil War um, in fighting nearby on the Mississippi River. And he's from Schenectady. He had no connection to St. Francisville at all, except for being a member of the Freemasons. You can see the uh, 
Masonic symbol here and the one lower down. I won't try to describe what they are because I'll get it wrong. Um, but because his association with the Freemasons and the Freemasons here in St. Francisville, they actually stopped the fighting for a day and had a burial ceremony for Mr. Hart and laid him to rest here in a proper Masonic burial. The only time the war stopped in this area. And that is reenacted and remembered every year by the Masons. As the day the war stopped. As the day the war stopped. One other standout tomb here, y'all. This is one that we always kind of paid attention to as kids coming out here and guides showing people through it. This is a tomb that, depending on who you ask, either was used by a man to bury his wife, but he wanted to still visit her, or as not a tomb at all, but a Civil War hideout. Either way, you needed a way to get underground, and while originally this would have been closed off with bricks, you can see the means of getting underground. This is a door with hinges, and behind it, there are stairs leading down into an underground space. On our way out of the Episcopalian Cemetery and church grounds, also we're passing through the Catholic Cemetery, which has a small enclosed section of gravestones from this Catholic burial ground and the one down in Bayou Serra, formerly, that have been relocated here and that aren't attached to their burial sites anymore. You got these great old names. There's a guy named Solomon Wisdom right here of the, I guess, the Wisdom family that still exists down in New Orleans. And, uh, Makes some good reading when you can still make out the text. So y'all, there's no missing when you've reached the edge of town because eventually the road goes off the bluff down into the space that used to be Bayou Serra, and once in a while this area still floods to remind us what a good idea it was to move the town up the hill. So uh, St. Francisville did in the early 1800s what New Orleans has not done yet. Recovered. <laughs> Prevented. <laughs> All those things. So from here, basically, the road goes down to an old ferry landing. Not a bad spot for fishing if you want to try fishing in the Mississippi River. I mean, yeah, it's actually not bad. It all depends on like where you go. The, the best thing though is when this floods down here um, and then the, the water starts to recede, if you come at the right time, you can actually catch the fish with your hand. And also if it happens during the right time of year, you can actually go out there with like a, 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 tra a trash can or a trash bag and a broom and you can literally sweep the crawfish literally into the... I told y'all, I'm a foodie, like for real, like, and I love living off the, uh, off the earth, so y'all know I know all the secrets. I love it, I love it. Yeah. Things, <laughs> I got some stuff to learn here, we're gonna keep having this conversation. However, gotten the view out over the, the old historic town, and with that, our steps turned back. We got one more installment of this trip to do, getting on up to Natchez tomorrow. So, for now, if y'all have thoughts about St. Francisville, questions about St. Francisville, comparisons with your own cool small town, theories about how a small town manages to stay cool, even in the days when small towns are on the wane, let us know. Bring it all down in the comments. Give us your likes, help other people find this. Hit the bell in order to get notifications when we get chapter five out. And you can find, if you wanna tip your guides, donation information for all of us collectively down there in the description as well. So thank you for watching. Any sign offs? Signing off. Thank y'all so much. We love you guys. Like, seriously, we love y'all so much. See you soon, a little further up the river. Howdy ho. Don't call me a ho. It looks like without pollen in your eye. Very first thing you'd want to do in order to get a real sense of the place is to stop on the way into town, right before you reach St. Francisville, at a place called... <laughs> I got the word hemming bow just completely left my mind. <laughs> oh my god. There's old glass bottles that we found, like whenever we were kids. Uh, just all out there. <laughs> we're, we are animal lovers, and so... <laughs>
Hey, hey. Dude, how you doing, man? I saw you walking down the street. I was like, who you red beard going to town? Yeah. Still Louisiana Purchase when New Orleans is already part of the United States. Sorry, what? Ruby just looks so confused. I, I have pollen in my eyes. Okay. It's, and I'm trying to, I'm sorry. Uh, take care of that. I'll, I'll just go tight on Andrew <laughs> so you can keep going. It's fine. <laughs> sorry. I just don't want to be distracted. So this is all a few years after the Louisiana purchase. <laughs> Y'all got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I was clear.